now with all these wonders in modern electronics? Well, there are many, many interesting developments taking place in telephones. The Japanese now are just about to bring out a scratch pad telephone where, as well as speaking to a person, you can write a little message on a pressure sensitive pad and send a note as well. Also, there's work going on on video telephones where you're combining now TV and telephones. But it'll be some time before that's a commercial reality because of cost and because of the limited bandwidth available. The sound that you hear across a telephone line at the moment isn't very high quality, but moves are afoot to make that hi-fi quality. People's perception now of sound is very different to what it used to be. They have a better understanding of how the brain and the ear work. And so, hopefully before long, we'll be able to improve that quality. And there are all these interactive databases that are available now, like Presto. Very shortly, Presto will be bringing out a simple system where you can call in any telephone number in the whole of the UK and Europe. But the dramatic change that has taken place in the last five or six years is cordless communications. We know now that you can communicate from a car, a moving plane, or from a train. And those of you who've seen the soap opera Bread will be very familiar with simple uh, cordless telephones like this here. This kind of phone, we'll call a CT1 phone, this is a cordless telephone one phone, is an analog phone. About half a million people in this country now use phones like this. But because a very restricted bandwidth is available, the whole system is reaching saturation. But in 1989, there will be a dramatic change. And we'll be using, instead of this phone, which I'll call a CT1 phone, a much more portable phone called CT2 phone. CT2 phone. Let me explain to you the basic difference between them. I've shown here the electromagnetic spectrum. And the region we're interested in with cordless phones is in the radio microwave region. In this region down here. Now let's just blow up that region there. We're talking about frequencies in the range 10 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz. What has been reserved for the CT2 phone is a special band just about here. There's 4 megahertz of bandwidth being made available between 864 megahertz and 868 megahertz. And that 4 megahertz will be broken down into 40 channels of 100 kilohertz each. And that will give ample scope for more and more people to have access to a cordless phone. So this here is a digital phone. This was an analog phone. The marketeers are predicting that in about five years' time, four million people in this country will have phones like this. They're also saying that by the end of this century, half the people in Western Europe will have these phones. They only weigh about four and a half ounces. They'll cost about 150 pounds. You also need a base station like this in your home, which costs about the same amount. There are a couple of snags with these existing phones. One is that if you take it out shopping with you or take it to the office, you'll need to be within about 200 meters of a base station like this in order to make a call. But the idea is that there will be thousands of these base stations positioned all through the country. Another disadvantage is that you can only call out with these phones. You can't receive a call, but you could receive a bleep. My prediction, just as I predicted that the incandescent bulb will be replaced almost totally by the fluorescent bulb, and just like other things that I've mentioned to you in the last few lectures about vanishing LPs and so on, I predict that the traditional telephone will vanish in the next 15 years or so to be replaced 
by these very, very handy phones that just slip into your pocket. These phones will become as common, I think, as wristwatches. Very, very common. And so, although it took 100 years to get us to where we have been in the last five years, the rate of change now is so dramatic, we can expect changes virtually every week, I think, in this fascinating field of cordless telephones. Let me now, for the remainder of my lecture, turn my attention to communications in the home. Communications technology and computer technology, that marriage has already taken place and produced office automation and factory automation. But the next stage will be home automation. Now, what do we mean by home automation? Could it be this? Are you eating again? No wonder you're getting fat. Your toast is ready. The kettle has boiled. There is enough there is for enough two cups. Two cups. The kettle, the has, kettle has boiled. The egg whites are stiffly beaten. The egg whites are stiffly beaten. The oven is still on. 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 Please clean. Please clean. Your toast is ready. 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 Remember to lock the door. Remember to lock the door. You have left the light on. Thank you. Now, isn't that horrible? And I can assure you that home automation does not mean what that film clip showed. Home automation is for the benefit of the consumer. The technology is already here. It's the consumer that's pushing and pushing to have it introduced into the home. Because there are three major benefits of home automation. One is convenience. The idea that you can communicate from one room to another in the home or from anywhere outside into the home as well. The second is an economical one to improve energy management in the home. And the third is to give people more peace of mind in terms of security in the home. The thing that distinguishes an ordinary home from a smart or intelligent home is the communications medium inside it. And what I want to explore with you now is different kinds of communications and try and guide you through to what we're likely to have in the home of the future. Many of you will be familiar with this kind of handheld controller which sends an infrared beam to the television. So I can very easily switch that on and off. But if I put a card in the way, it doesn't work, you see? But that's the way it does. So one of the disadvantages of infrared communication is that the radiation doesn't travel through even a piece of cardboard, let alone a wall between rooms. Another disadvantage is if sunlight is pouring in through the window and introducing some radiation, if I could have some lights on to simulate the radiation. Oh, it's not bright enough. Oh, there it is. It's working, but not very, very efficiently. If you have very bright sunlight, it interferes with an infrared controller like this. Some years ago, televisions used to be controlled not by infrared, but by ultrasonic means. This is one such television set. But you just watch what happens when I jangle these keys. There we are. The ultrasonic sound produced by these jangling keys interferes with that set. The RSPCA were very glad when we got rid of this means because, of course, dogs and animals can hear higher frequencies and it used to disturb them. In previous lectures, I mentioned radio frequencies for cooking, for lighting, and also, as you've just heard, for telephones. Is it possible that we could use radio frequencies in the home? Many of you may already have used radio frequencies in the home using cars like this that can be remotely controlled. I have my own special transmitter here for radio frequencies. I built my own. It's a very, very special transmitter. And I also have my special car as well. As you can see, it's a Volkswagen. 
but it's not German. It proudly displays the Welsh flag. And what I'd like is an assistant to help me play with this time. Would you like to help? What's your name? Chris. Oh, hello, Chris. Right, now, you're going to have to control my transmitter here. Let me switch it on for you. And that's the control button. So let me just now put the master switch on this. Oops. Oh, that's very clever. You're guiding it very well. Gosh, that's lovely, isn't it? Thank you very much, Chris. Do you know we've been breaking the law? You better get up to your seat before you're arrested. I'll tell you why. The reason we've been breaking the law, Chris, is that the frequencies and the intensities allowed for radio frequency controlled cars are very restricted. And for the purpose of this lecture, I've used a frequency outside the permitted range. The radio frequency band of allowed energies is being clogged up. Everybody wants to use radio frequencies. Although I didn't do it with Chris there, radio frequencies would pass through virtually anything. They certainly would pass through a solid wall. So in a sense, it's a very convenient means of communication to use in the home. But legislation doesn't permit it. Radio frequencies can only be sent at certain particular frequencies for, let's say, the cordless telephone or for other applications. It may be that there will be some reduction in that uh, legislation in, in due course, but at the moment you just cannot use radio frequencies in the home. You must also remember that more sophisticated communication means like fiber optic communications are ruled out in terms of cost. What we want is a very simple system that we can retrofit into an existing home. One of the systems that we have in a home that I haven't yet mentioned is mains wiring. And let me explain to you now how we can imagine our home of the future being wired up. These orange colors here refer to an infrared sensor in the ceiling of a room. So if I'm sitting in a lounge chair, I can communicate just like I did with the television with this sensor in the ceiling. In order now to be able to communicate with appliances throughout the house, I'm going to make use of the mains. And so here I've shown the mains. And every appliance is connected to the mains. And this combination of infrared and mains, the two together, would give me all I need in the automated home. Now, you know how infrared works, but how does mains-borne communication work? Well, this is shown on the next slide. This is the 240 volts of the mains. What we're going to do now is to superimpose a small voltage on top of this mains voltage. Let's look at that in an expanded form. This is my half of a volt I've added to the 240 volts of mains. And as you can see, it's divided up into three parts. The first one here is we call the address code. It's important that the appliance that you're sending it to has a certain address. What you mustn't do is have the wrong address. The last thing you'd want to do, let's say, is to switch on the washing machine next door in mistake if you send in a signal. There's an expression that goes something like, Friends may come, but friends may go, but enemies accumulate. So you must be very, very careful not to do things like that. But you see that the address code is a binary code. The second stage here is the message. Switch on the cooker. Put it to 715 degrees or whatever. The third component is the checksum. The mains is a very noisy medium, and it's important when you add a small signal, that it doesn't get corrupted. And so what you would do here is something like add a sum, 2 plus 2 equals 4. And if it isn't 4, it'll ask the message to be transmitted again. In practice, of course, it's a very complicated checksum that is done. And so using this principle, 
it's possible to send an infrared message remotely from your armchair and then have it sent along the mains to the appropriate appliance. I want to demonstrate Mainsborne working to you now. I have here a sing simple modem that I can plug into any socket here at the RI. Let's suppose that I plug it in there. And I'm going to take a lamp as my example, but in fact this could be any appliance. It could be a dryer or a video recorder. And I'm going to ask somebody to plug it in to one of the sockets up here. I think along here you should find a red socket about halfway along. And again, that could have been any socket in the Royal Institution here. And if I switch on here, what I will have is control over that appliance there. So that I can switch on that light and I can dim it. So that is an illustration of Mainsborne communication. I have another example here. And this demonstrates Mainsbourne in a different mode. 2,000 houses in Milton Keynes at the present time are fitted with meters like this. These are remote meters enabling the electricity board, the water board, the gas board to measure at a distance just what your meter reading is. And so by dialing in here the utility, it could be gas, water, electricity, the consumer at home can also find out how many units he or she has used and what the likely estimate is for the quarter. You can do more than that, though. You can also, by collaborating with these public utility boards, specify that at certain periods when the electricity board finds it hard to meet the demand, that you're quite in agreement with them switching off some of these large energy loads such as water heating and space heating. So when that light is on, you're quite happy for the electricity board to interrupt your water heating, or similarly, the space heating. And so there's a dialogue now which is possible between you and the public utilities, and that will save you money. What other advantages do we have in the smart home? Well, this is the kind of controller that you will have, the portable controller, and you will be able to control lighting, heating, home entertainment, and so on, using this kind of portable controller. This is just a prototype here. So, for example, you can use your video recorder in this unit here to switch on a television, put a film on in any room in the house. By using the lighting menu here, you can decide what groups of lights you want switched on. If you're reading or watching television or just about to go down the garden path, you'll want different groups of lights on. And so you can do that with this controller here. This controller can memorize all the lighting pattern in the house for a fortnight. And so if you go off on a two-week holiday, you can fool the burglar by having a lighting sequence that comes on almost as if you were living in the house and the curtains would open and close uh, in synchronism. So there are many advantages of using this kind of controller. Now let me finish by showing you an important example to do with security. And I'd like somebody who's tall to help me out. Would you, sir, like to come down and help me with this? What I'd like you to do is to stand here and pretend that you're coming into my front outside, you're outside my home, and when I tell you to, I want you to go and knock on the door. And what I'm going to do is to pretend that I'm in my television lounge watching Tottenham beating Arsenal. Thank you. <laughs> Let's switch on the television now. There's a nice shot there. Now what I'd like you to do is to go and knock on my door. You see the proximity lighting's come on. Immediately you that's come on, I can see a picture-in-picture picture on this television here, which I can blow up to full frame if I want. 
And now I can see you and I can decide that you're friendly and I'll come and open the door. You'd probably have security cameras like the one that is fitted to this door in other parts of the house. You might want to have it in the nursery so that you can monitor your child while he or she is sleeping and you're watching television. Or you might use it for some um, perimeter detection as well. Well, today we've talked about various communication technologies. Now let's try and bring it all together. Here I have the cordless phone, the portable phone that you can use to communicate wherever you might be, in the office, in the shops, perhaps on the golf course. And you can communicate directly with virtually any appliance in your home. This phone looks surprisingly like one used in science fiction programs like Star Trek. What do they say on that program? Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me back, Scotty. I haven't finished the programme. Let me explain to you exactly how this special screen works, which, just with the throw of a switch, is either transparent or opaque. It's made of glass that contains a special kind of liquid crystal molecule. And so you can use this type of screen for security purposes in an office or perhaps in a vehicle. And I'll be saying a lot more in my lecture tomorrow about liquid crystal materials. But for today, I hope that I've communicated things well with you and that you and I have been on the same wavelength. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> See, I'm turning the power on full now, and that really is a quiet motor. So this motor, which has been developed with help from the University of Glasgow, really is excellent in two regards. The control you have over the frequency, and then, of course, how quiet it is. So if we look at the bridge of technology here, if you remember, the right-hand side shows scientific advance. The left-hand side is really trends in society, the marketplace. On the right-hand side, we've seen how control theory has developed to enable us to control those power integrated circuits. On the left, the need for a quiet kitchen, and of course that variable speed, because there are many, many appliances in the home. It's not just this food mixer, but where you'd like to have that variable speed. Things like washing machines and dishwashers and so on. And so that really is an important bridge of technology. The next application of silicon that I'd like to discuss is very, very different to that. It's not silicon microelectronics, but silicon microengineering. I'm going to switch on a demonstration now to do with the etching of silicon, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes' time. It's possible these days to make motors no bigger than the size of a human hair. That isn't an exaggeration. With silicon microengineering, you can make small cogwheels, you can make small springs, unbelievably small. And the principle is etching silicon. Silicon, you see, doesn't etch uniformly. If you take a chemical such as potassium hydroxide, it attacks silicon much more quickly in certain directions than others. In this model here, the gray area is the silicon. The green is the natural oxide, silicon oxide, that goes on the surface. And on the top here, I put a passivating layer, something that you can easily remove. If we etch away a certain shape, as I've done here, it's very easy to etch away the silicon oxide under there as well. And that exposes the clean silicon surface. If we now apply an etch, like the potassium hydroxide, it attacks that silicon much more severely in the vertical direction than in the lateral direction. So very quickly, you'd see planes and planes of silicon being removed like this. Obviously, there's some etching in the lateral direction, 
but this is much, much slower. And so you can etch away a pet. That exposes certain cleavage planes like this. And they have an intermediate etching rate. So gradually, they will, they will etch away. And further etching will take, take those away as well. And you can see what we've done now. We've created an overhang here. And in this way, using different kinds of chemicals, you can create all sorts of interesting structures. What I've done in the demonstration here, I'm doing something in real time. I'm etching silicon. What I've started with there is a silicon wafer. Here again is the silicon oxide, but I've exposed a circle of silicon. And we'll let that etch for about 10 minutes or so, and we'll see now what shape that circle becomes after the etching process. Well, in what way can we use silicon microengineering in the home? Well, you see on my right here an old gas meter. But really, you know, gas meters have hardly changed in the last 50 or 60 years. They still rely on a mechanical displacement. Your gas displaced is a mechanical diaphragm. And it's a very ugly thing, too, so you always hide it under the stairs or in the garage. It's not a very attractive thing. Meter reading first occurred in 1815. That's when they first sent out meter men to read the gas meter. These days, though, people are much more wary about letting strangers into the home. And so there's a move afoot to try and read these kinds of meters remotely. And you heard about Mainsbourne in a previous lecture. But obviously, we'd clearly love to miniaturize this as well. There's another driving force for a new type of gas meter. The gas board now receives gas from all around the shores of England, not just the North Sea. And the density varies. And the calorific value of gas, which determines the value for money you get, depends on density. This type of gas meter only me measures the flow rate. It doesn't measure, measure the density. What we need, therefore, is a, a small, compact meter that will measure flow and density. And silicon microengineering will do that for us. I have here a large model of a silicon flow sensor. The dimensions are probably 100 times smaller than this. What I've tried to indicate here, this black is silicon. And you can, as you can see, I have a, a cantilever beam here. The gold sections are metal electrodes. So the principle is very simple. A gas flow comes along and displaces that cantilever beam. There's a capacitor here. And therefore, you can detect that change in capacitance and measure the flow rate. The dimensions are typically 20 micrometers along here and about 200 micrometers along the cantilever. Unbelievably small. On the film here, I've actually shown one of these silicon sensors vibrating. This is the gas pipe dimension. Here is the silicon sensor. You see the metal electrode here in purple. And the black area is the pit of silicon that it's moving into. So if a gas flow comes from this direction, it forces the silicon beam to vibrate. Another gas flow, if you turn it up, back in again it goes. And then if you increase the gas supply even more, again. These things